welcome. It's a um, uh, second run of that talk. So excuse me for the slide. I kept the same. <laughs> so let's go. That talk, so we're going to speak about trench story and mainly about drinking champagne. That talk will be mainly about speaking about what is a code lab and some example. So this implies virtual machine workload, container workload, and container orchestration. That talk is absolutely not um, a try on a tool to make it better or a war between tools. So don't expect me to say I prefer one or the other tools. It's just an experimentation. And I won't show any code. You have a link. You can click it. It's available on GitHub if you want to play with that. Um, it's no guarantee. It's just for our own usage. So you, you prefer champagne to whatever tool it is, champagne's better. <laughs> Exactly, better than dog food. Basically. Yeah. So the, the main idea of drinking hound champagne is as someone teaching other people using classes, I also learn by trying things because this is a natural and human process. So two rules uh, on based on that. The first one is you never waste time when you experiment, even if you throw everything you have produced to a bin, you still had learned something. Secondly, always focus on build something that works and then iterate to make it optimized. That's very important or you're gonna uh, distribute your mind on too many tasks that more than you can handle. So this is the story of uh, the tales of scaling some code labs. So first of all, trainer speaking, we need to define what is a code lab. Uh, in that presentation, the word code lab is a synonym of what you could, should call a workshop or hands-on lab. So it's a part of a training, so part of a learning experience. It's a practical exercise. It means that after seeing a document that explain a concept in an abstract way, this is the step where you try by yourself to understand exactly that abstract concept. This is a practical exercise. The code lab technically is an isolated environment dedicated to only one user. So that means that if you run, I don't know, a class about uh, Nginx, the web server, you will have one web server per attendee of your class and not one web server shared by everyone. This is a very important concept. So um, I used to say that the code lab is production. So the idea is to say when you run a class, it is your production. And the pattern of challenges that you will have on that infrastructure met the same as you could have in a real life and ver production environment. Mainly, the, the network will fail. If you are on a conference, the, the Wi-Fi will cut at any moment. Or worse, it will be completely slow. So you will spend and waste time. And so you need um, some music or some jokes to, to, to pass the time. And also, be sure that by running code labs, you will face your worst nightmare about diversity of configuration from someone with Windows XP trying to run Docker on that OS uh, to someone with a homemade uh, open BSD with a Dvorak keyboard and absolutely no GUI. You will have everything you could dream or, or have nightmare about. And, and those users will also expect you to, uh, to give you training based on their configuration, right? Exactly. But I put that uh, assumption in the user error, because I, uh, when you run a practical session, your mind is not, uh, it's, very, it's more difficult to be empathetic against the trainer or the presenter than in normal life, mm. because you are in a learning process. So mainly, the effort required by your brain to learn is simply disabling other cognitive function. So you are in user error mode. So if even if you are Linus Torvald himself, when you are learning, you are going back to school and you lost all your reflexes. 
But this is totally normal. This is the learning process. This is how the brain is wired and how it works. So the user error is mainly how oh, your user is going to use your um, environment is absolutely not what you thought at the first time when you built it. So it's like in production when you build an application. Finally, the fourth, fourth challenge is time box session. This means that you will face some load peak on your infrastructure because all the attendees will do the same operation at the same time. It's like having your web application on a, uh, on a um, daily article. So everyone goes at the same time on this. So in our case, the tales I'm telling here is about the Jenkins training, obviously. So here is the content of the machine in order to give you an idea. In that code lab, so in that isolated environment, we have to run a Jenkins master and the build agents, obviously. So this is based on GVMs. We store the code locally, so using Gitty, which is a Git server written in Go, because you have people that don't want to create a GitHub account. You have people that just don't understand it or might not have access or might not have the right or whatever reason. So everything local. We have a web command line because I want everyone to have the same experience. And if we start to ask people to just run a single bash command line, it, you already failed because you won't have the same thing between Sigwin and Git bash and macOS hold bash version and different Linux distribution. So we provide a, a command line on the web because the web is one of the best platform ever. So to provide the same user experience, we have a web command line. Same for the web ID. Don't want to start a war, but whatever solution we have, half of the people won't know your solution. If you choose Eclipse, you will have NetBeans user or whatever. So we provide the tools also inside the web browser. We have to store our artifacts and our Docker images because we do Docker on that training. So when we started that training from scratch, the first three challenges were, first, we need to define this service list. So to define that and to put it in code, we wanted to use Docker Compose because with a single YAML file, you can have a very clear view on which service is defined. You don't have to search across a lot of different files or locations. The second challenge was the portability. Um, the thing is that sometimes we run using VirtualBox on local machines. Sometimes we run on a cloud, but this cloud can change based on who is going to give us uh, credits. So are you going to run on AWS EC2, on Azure, on DigitalOcean, on OVH? So we choose to use Docker to have a blueprint. As soon as we have a Docker engine, then we are able to run our isolated stack and duplicate that one. So here is the first implementation. So um, basically, we have a trainer, and the trainer used Terraform, which is a command line tool to deploy infrastructure as code. So we have a local repo Git repository that defines the infrastructure, the VMs, and it deploys with a simple command lines. This goes through a SSH machine. It's a bone server for security, so no direct access to the machines. And this will deploy using your remote cloud, a set of VMs. So if you have 20 attendees, you have 20 VMs. Each VM start and register itself on a um, configuration database, which is console. And finally, we have reverse proxies that once each VM has registered and started clearly, does it check and then update the reverse proxy. So each student can access its own instance. Remember, we said it was isolated. After running a bunch of those kind of trainings, especially in context of classes, uh, four takeaways. The first one, it works. Whatever criticizing we can do on that architecture, it works. So this is the first step and very good step. Second thing, it was quite easy to begin with and to operate for a few people that are technical enough. But at least it was a start, and this was the goal we wanted to meet at that moment. 
So, uh, so that means that like, does the presenter have to be technical or uh, did you do some, a bunch of sort of work in there to make it easy for them? Um, you know, oh, this should be. Basically, the presenter have to be uh, technical enough because okay. it will face some bugs or non-wanted behavior at runtime, so running the training. Sure. And the trainer was responsible to deploy its own machines generally. Right. Okay. We this we can automate that process. This is one of the improvement that we could have. Right. Mm -hmm. So the first problem we we hit was the cost. Yeah, one person for one VM, it's too much. We are in 2017, and there are better ways of doing that. So one of the improvements that can be done is the cost. The second one is the time to play. Building a new machine takes an order of magnitude of minutes. So when you are developing your training and prepare your lab, let's say you want to upgrade a plugin on your Jenkins embedded instance or pre-install a package to let the user play with, between the moment where you have the idea and say, OK, I need to change that text file to change the configuration until the moment you have a VM which is in your remote cloud and ready to play, you have to wait minutes or worse. So this one, this was one of the main challenges. Because VMs take time to spin up. Yeah. Exactly. I would say no, because the configuration and the infrastructure we use takes time. Ah, OK. V VM can be quick. Ah, OK, it fair. Depends fair. on how you use them. But yeah, let, let's say VM for sake of simplicity. So that pattern of challenge is well known since some years now. So that's why this helped us to draw the road to a native orchestration. So we want to put more people per virtual machine because the cost unit on a lot of clouds is changing and it's not always true. But basically, in our case, the, un the cost, the basic unit cost is the virtual machine. So we want to put more people per virtual machine to optimize the costs. The second thing is that when you start to use native orchestration, so we mean native uh, container native orchestration, so using something like Mesos, uh, Rancher, Docker Swarm, Docker Swarm mode, Kubernetes, or whatever orchestrator we can have, Nomad, um, all those share the same property, which is they start container very efficiently. They orchestrate correctly what you want to do your workload on the cluster. So I don't know if you had the opportunity to test, but I recommend you if you want to play quickly with Docker or learn Docker to use play with Docker. This is this come from the community. And this is a free online uh, Docker as a service. You go to a page, you check that you are not a bot, and you click on new instance. And in one or two seconds, you have an instance. So I would say two seconds per instance, you start five instance. Then you type the command and you have a Docker Swarm cluster free for the four next hours. We talk about seconds to start instances. So this is that speed, that uh, smell of speed is very interesting, especially for our use cases. And so the time to play is also um, addressable by untying infrastructure from services. We don't want the trainer uh, to manage infrastructure. So here is how we tried one or two classes. So this is our current states moving to native orchestration. First thing is the infrastructure administrator. So the person responsible for starting VM, generally the person who pays. So we still deploy with Terraform for a lot of reasons that I don't want to explain now. If you, have, if you want to discuss that question after. And that person is only responsible to start a cluster. Uh, an orchestration cluster. In our case, it's a swarm mode, so the latest version of swarm embedded on each Docker engine installation. So you have two kinds of machines. You have the managers that are the, the brain of the cluster and the workers that handle the container load. So you only have to do this. You could do this with Kubernetes or Mesos. We just choose swarm almost randomly. The second thing, is that you have the trainer, and your trainer is here to provide services. So the trainer have 
access to the Docker Swarm primitives and can schedule services and classes. Based on that, the trainer only need an SSH access to the bastion and don't need any key or any credit card to access any clouds anywhere. Then benefits. Your user can directly access your support services running on the, uh, on the brain of the cluster and you don't have to care. So for the end user, nothing changes, which is good because it's the goal. One of the positive side effects we had while trying this native orchestration is that there is so much things on the Docker ecosystem that a lot of things that we were doing ourselves, we don't have to anymore. We just have to delete the worst, all those code or configuration. We don't have to maintain this. And this is some kind of IT maturity. The less code you have to maintain, the better it will be for you. So by trying that native orchestration pattern for the infrastructure, in the case of a Jenkins training, we had still had three problems, but I would say nice problem to have, or rich problem, or first world problems. We had the scaling pattern the monitoring and metrics of the infrastructure and the resource management. So I just want to, to check on those. So first, the scaling pattern. When we talk about scaling horizontally a service, you have, let's say, reverse proxy and a middleware and the database on a basic and stereotyped application. You just want to have n times the same application. But in our case, what we want is n times the same stack. So I just want to duplicate my stack. So the uh, normal primitives used for scaling in Docker were absolutely not useful because we don't want to scale the Jenkins or uh, the web ID or the DevBox service. We don't want to scale horizontally one of the services. We just want to duplicate. So this was a bit of challenge in the sense that we had to script that. So I recently started to learn Kubernetes, and Kubernetes have the concept of pods that will help to implement that. So this might be a third iteration in the future. Okay. Uh, FYI, uh, Damien, we've got five minutes left. No problem. I got three slides left. Perfect. Second challenge is monitoring metrics. So in fact, it's a false challenge. I should have done that as step one. I did not add any way of measuring and iterating. My feedback loop was not closed at the first iteration. So I had, I, it's not a challenge caused by the first improvement going to native orchestration. The good thing in that is that there is also so much things in the uh, Docker and container um, ecosystem that we just had to start a few containers as a admin and not as a trainer. And we had a lot of metrics. So starting uh, Elasticsearch to store data, Grafana to have to see the metrics, and we were OK. Why did we need monitoring metrics? Because when the one VM does not work or one stack, you just have to restart it, yeah? Especially if it's a matter of seconds. It's because of the resource management. Running pipeline with Jenkins was the most complicated part to address because we had to know how many memory amount of memory or CPU are used during a given training. So we had to automate the testing of the training and measure that. Because even if you give some XMX to Jenkins, the pipeline is executed as groovy and might use more memory than you can exactly have. So you need to know what happens, or if Jenkins asks to use too much memory, then your system will just kill the container. So the good thing is that it's quick to start containers. So the restart of Jenkins was quite transparent most of the time when we faced that. But having made monitoring and metric help us to shape that and to know how many memory are we going to use to help compressing people on VMs. So we had a profile on and a shape management of resources. So takeaways, it still work, which is good. When you change something, you are happy if it works. That's the base of TDD. It's easier to begin. We don't need technical trainer anymore. They just have to file a text file, and that's OK. The cost, 
four, four times less because we had four people per VM instead of one. The big improvement is the time to play, order of magnitude of seconds to start one environment for one instead of 10 minutes. And code maturity, less tool to maintain. That's all. Excellent. So yeah, you and I have been, uh, I've been working with Damien here, actually uh, writing some of the, the, helping to write some new training. And uh, I have to say, it's really a pleasure to work in from the, from the writing and, uh, and the use side, both sides. It's easy to, uh, to create the training and then also the, the being able to just spin up another uh, code lab whenever you need it is, is uh, fantastic uh, to be able to test those things out and then also to be able to, to see it work. Um, we use this at uh, Jenkins World actually to do some uh, a, a number of things, and it it worked like flawlessly. So, thank you very much. Thank you.